What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Culture 316. I am one of your co-hosts and producers, Jordan Ahisi. Brought to you by Return of the Mo. I wasn't here last week, but I'm back, people. What's up? Typical <laughs> Peel Mask Mo is back, y'all. But anyway, thank you guys so much for tuning in to another episode. I think this is episode 15, if I'm not mistaken. Thank you guys for continuing to support the podcast. Um, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you're on YouTube or if you're on Facebook or if you're on Instagram or whatever it may have you. If you are on uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts, be sure to like uh, and subscribe. Give the show five stars. Be genuinely appreciated because that is how you guys keep us going and how we continue to chart and all these good things. Thank you guys so much for your continued support. But for, without further ado, we're going to get right into the show. So first thing is first. Uh, so this past week, actually late last week, WWE had announced uh, that Survivor Series this year will be taking place in Chicago. Now, this is not the only big event uh, of the fall season that will be taking place in Chicago as AEW also announced, I believe it was All Out or yeah, All Out Weekend, which will be in Chicago, I believe in September. So, one, I want to know how you feel about Survivor Series being in Chicago. And do you think too much wrestling uh, is happening in Chicago at this point? Because this, between AEW, between WWE, it just seems like there's a lot going on. I feel like it's very risky, but it kind of goes to show you the confidence that WWE has in itself. Because I personally, if I was running a business, I would just try to find another state that equally mm. is obsessed with wrestling and make that my bitch. But mm. that's pretty bold of you to even like decide to they will come downstairs one day um if i if it were me i personally would have found an another state because i feel as though when you pollute one state with so much of one thing it kind of lowers lowers the urgency to want to go like for example they don't come to new york that often both both shows they don't come to new york too often so you feel the need that oh shit they're gonna be in new york but they're going to the barclays like you yeah, know should i take advantage cool. now because if not i'm not gonna like get this opportunity for another six to eight months with the way that they move so <laughs> i feel like you kind of maybe have to let it play out just a little bit but i feel like chicago does feel like it's AEW now mm. like now if you mention chicago especially because they got like their their lord and savior cm punk over there i just feel like chicago made up their mind like there's people in chicago walking around with cm punk tattoos for crying out loud like their loyalty is to that man and i feel like it's to that brand so it's gonna it's, it's a bold move mm. but if they manage to just like get enough like viewers and get enough like um tickets sold i would be shocked i'm not i'm not knocking it mm. i want to see what happens i'm, I'm rather intrigued but I'm just like, what is what oversaturating Chicago as if, again, like Philly and New York ain't right there? Do right. you think that they feel slighted that they lost a town that this, that's known for wrestling as well? What do you think? To be honest, I don't feel that WWE feels as if they have lost a town. I, I do believe, however, that they do want to keep this kind of this back and forth, this tit for tat interesting um, because... You know, obviously, AEW is having all out in London, all in in London, right? And then for Money in the Bank, we see John Cena come out and say, "We need WrestleMania in London." And then all, and then we have, you know, AEW doing all out in Chicago, and now WWE is trying to do Survivor Series in Chicago. So I think it's just a, a healthy form of one upsmanship, and I feel like that's what makes competition good that's what makes you know any wrestling boom period successful is when companies are trying to go tit for tat as it pertains to um survivor series being in chicago i think it's a great move um i don't feel like wwe is going to suffer because of AEW being in town because i mean AEW is going to be in town i think two months prior so it gives people enough time you know to gather their coins and also i believe that because wwe has has you know created a very very unique identity with the survivor series brand there are certain things that are very very unique to survivor series and make survivor series special that differentiates differentiates itself from aew's all-in shows granted all-in is their biggest show of the year but you know with all-in there is nothing that is signature about the show the Royal Rumble has the Royal Rumble the money in the bank match has the money in the bank match Wrestlemania is Wrestlemania 
right? The Survivor Series, uh, it is the show before Thanksgiving with the five-on-five -five traditional elimination style tag match or now with War Games. So you're going to get something in Survivor Series that is going to be different from whatever AEW is presenting because Survivor Series already kind of has its own identity. However, to kind of piggyback off of what you were saying, I do feel like Chicago is definitely being oversaturated with wrestling. Um, I think it's a lot. I think it's a lot. I it's It's interesting because the way that I feel like AEW is using Chicago is the same way that WWE was using Brooklyn back in like 2014, 2015, 2016. Like I remember there was like back to back to back Summer Slams, back to back to back NXT takeovers. Like then Raws and SmackDowns were all at the Barclays, and I feel like the way that AEW is using Chicago is kind of the way that WWE is using or was using New York City as a whole, and specifically the way that they were using the Barclays Center uh, a while ago. So I think that I feel like AEW is just trying to establish Chicago as its home base. Obviously, Tony Khan has his, has his own personal roots there. We all know how crazy of a city Chicago is when it comes to wrestling. And like you said, CM Punk is Chicago. So Yeah, word. I, I feel like a lot of employers must be fed up with the PTOs that are coming in for wrestling shows. Oh, bro. my God. <laughs> They've had enough. They've had enough. And it's worse when it's probably, and these employees is probably like, hey, yo, I, I got to call in six. Like, brother, we know. We know you're That's going to. That's a fucking ad. We know we're going, you're going to a wrestling show, my boy. Just be honest with us. But, I, but you know, we'll see what happens. I'm very, very excited to see Survivor Series in Chicago. Um yeah, that's that's pretty much it on my end. We want to know how you guys feel about uh, Survivor Series in Chicago. Um, let us know in the comments below, but we're going to keep this ball rolling. So, uh, speaking of WWE, uh, according to Dave Meltzer, um, it seems as if WWE is reporting record merchandise sales, which exceed the number of the Attitude Era. Um I think this is very, very indicative of just the success. Now, my question to you is, do you believe that WWE has kind of surpassed where they were during the Attitude Era at this point in time? That's so hard to answer because, like, it depends on how you look at it mm. um, and how you look at, like, the state of wrestling for what it is. Because you, if I go and ask my dad right now, and like, he started watching wrestling before the Attitude Era, but if you ask him, like, what's the best era He's going just like say the attitude. Or he's going to go into like the rock, stone cold, all that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because like if you ask any other person on the outside and you tell them make a wrestling reference right now, or you mention any type of tagline, if it's from the attitude era, they're going to perk up. But if you mention anything from now, they're like, oh yeah, yeah, I stopped watching it then because I realized right. it was fake. Blah 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 blah. But I feel like it's a beautiful thing. It's actually a beautiful thing that the merch sales are going up and. I wonder, is it contributed to the shows being a little bit better or is it because of like the mainstream outreach? Because shoot, I'll be opening up my phone and I see like Liv Morgan at like a Barbie event or whatnot. I see Bianca Belair and Wild and Out, you know, like they're they're still like WWE is still despite what everyone else thinks that's an outsider watching it, WWE is still like very much mainstream. Mm. You know? Yeah. So I don't I don't find it all that shocking. But it does make me excited as a fan to like see that it is like picking up popularity again. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm not sure if it has to contribute again to like the shows or it has to do like with the competition going around. Because I noticed too, even like with AEW, for example, they're also working on being mainstream as well. So it's not like they're not in the known. Right. I mean, they didn't didn't just take her and Michelle McCool just pop up on the shade room last night for crying out loud. I remember that. No, with, I'm just the saying, shark. Yeah, over a yeah. shark. <laughs> Over a shark, but it makes me smile. It really does make me smile that it's not, it doesn't feel like we're just like a little niche audience. Like it's like it's it it it, it brings a smile to my face, honestly. Mm -hmm. What do you think? So, this is a very very controversial topic because I was going back and forth with some someone on Twitter yesterday about this um about this particular topic. I'll read my tweet just so that the people them at home know. He was eating him up. I, I honestly was. And to be honest, we're, I'm going to start off with this. Facts matter, ladies and gentlemen. Data matters. Okay. There are some things that can be measured. There are some things that can't, but the facts mm -hmm. are the facts. And sometimes you got to get out of your, your feelings and you got to pay attention to what's real. So 
Um, no DQ obviously tweeted, you know, WWE's 2023 merchandise sales said to highest in company history, including the Attitude Era. I tweeted, while the Attitude Era remains one of the most iconic in WWE history, we can't continue with we can't continue to refer to it as the golden age anymore. WWE has never been bigger than it is right now, and the data and the numbers speak for itself. Now, this person, you know, there's a couple people that were like, what data? WWE makes a majority of its money from the TV streaming rights in Saudi Arabia. Another person was like, ah, well, the Attitude Era, they have bigger stars. I can't name a star for you in WWE right now. Let me explain something to you, all right? Yes, they make their money from Saudi Arabia. Yes, they make their money from TV and streaming rights. But we're talking about strictly financial here, all right? The most profitable year, uh, before 2016, the most profitable year in WWE was uh, 1999, where they brought in $68 million, right? They have beaten that year two or three times over in the past two two, two, two to three years. Uh, the merchandise sales have, have gone up. Uh, attendance has gone up. The TV rights and deals have gone up. The price on those have gone up. Everything about this era exceeds the previous era as far as the Attitude Era, if we're talking strictly financial. What I will say is that WWE's star power in the Attitude Era was great, was greater, and I feel like the stars that, that, that were in that era were bigger stars. The Rock, Stone Cold, Triple H, these were people that had crossover mainstream appeal that ended up going into mainstream America and doing film and doing television. Uh, and they were, you know, synonymous with pop culture because of what they did on WWE television. Now, because of what they did, they've added enormous amount of value and wealth to WWE, which is the reason why they can sell rights to their library to Peacock for millions of dollars. It's because that Stone Cold and that rock into intellectual property is included in that. Um, now, as it pertains to the whole merchandise sales being greater than it was in the Attitude Era, it, the argument is the same because you you still have the Rock t-shirts on sale. You still have Stone Cold Steve Austin t-shirts on sale. But now you have this entirely new wave of WWE superstars that are releasing merchandise that are extremely popular. You have guys coming from outside of WWE. Do we not forget Bad Bunny? Did we not forget Logan Paul? Did we, you know what I'm saying? Like all these guys are coming in, they're bringing eyes to the product, they're bringing their audience to the product, and now that audience is cashing in and they're getting the merchandise too. They're part of the social media views that have gone up. So there's a lot of different factors as to why WWE financially is doing better now than it used to. It doesn't always have to deal with necessarily just uh, the wrestling star power. There's star power being brought in from there's star power being brought outside, being brought from outside of WWE. There's partnerships and deals being made with other mainstream companies. You have other WWE superstars, multiple WWE superstars who are going mainstream. We saw Seth Rollins and Becky Lynch on ESPN. Montez Ford and Bianca Belair have a show that's supposed to be, you know, a reality show. We can't forget about Roman Reigns doing mainstream stuff. Drew McIntyre is about to be in a movie. So we have now multiple stars who kind of are doing that mainstream crossover appeal thing, obviously not at the level that The Rock or Austin did, but they're still doing that. And then you have merchandise, and then you have these deals that are in place. So I feel like, and 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 to kind of build on top of that, and I know I'm babbling a little bit, but and to build on top of that, the reason why I said that the Attitude Era cannot be referred to as the golden era is because anytime we refer to a, an era as golden or a superstar as golden, we are referring to their profitability, right? A lot of people consider Hulk Hogan the biggest wrestler of all time because of how much he drew. We call John Cena the greatest of all time because of how much he drew. So if we're basing someone's greatness based off of how much they're drawing, does the same stand for errors? Does this era stand as a greater era than the Attitude Era because because it's more profitable now than it used to be? Just things to think about. Things to ponder on, you know? I mean, you're most likely arguing with a boomer. <laughs> like, let's be honest. No, I just feel like in 2023, if you're bringing up, like, Hulk Hogan in your arguments and, like, the whole Golden Era thing, I just feel like you're not paying attention. Like, you probably tuned out of wrestling over a decade 15 years ago at least and you just you just kind of can't get over that things move on 
right. other stars take place and they take place in different forms. Like I understand that yes, Hulk Hogan was part of a bunch of like commercials and deals and he was on cereal boxes and stuff like that. Like he he did like a lot for his time, but now it's a different time where you have like so many different like paths that could make you otherwise get your product around. As you mentioned, um, the crossovers, the shows, the movies and stuff like that. And I just feel like people just maybe because not in front of their faces or they're not watching it, they're not accepting it. But I think that we did reach another golden era. It's just not in the form that we're used to seeing it. Or maybe because maybe the people that you speak to aren't talking about it. But that's kind of how the way the world works. We're still somewhat of a niche audience. But it doesn't mean that on the outside looking in, they're not still the biggest company right now and hitting another high. Whether at in terms of profitability, they're I just agree. doing it a different way. Sorry, go ahead. No, I agree with you one hundred percent. I was actually going to say, and I was just thinking about this, and I wanted to ask you. Speaking of eras in WWE, what is your favorite era of WWE? Is it this era? Is it the Attitude Era? Um, it's hard. I always feel like I, whenever I get this question, I always struggle with seeing the ruthless aggression and the Attitude Era. Just because the Attitude Era was so fun, so chaotic. Yes, it, it, it birthed like the most memorable characters of all time. But I wandered in as a small child around like 2004, yeah. you know, and like that's when John Cena became my hero. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like John Cena, Randy, Eddie and all that stuff. And it was still bleeding parts of the Attitude Era, but it wasn't like nearly as, I mean, it was a little messy, but it wasn't like Vince Russo messy. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It was still very like, you had storylines that were super compelling in the wrestling that matched up. Like that's when you had like the superior stars come in, like Kurt Angle mm. and, you know, who, the who, he, he, who should not be, you know, mentioned, um, Benoit, um, you know, Batista was great. John Cena was great. Shawn Michaels. I mean, yes, I know he was in a previous era. Triple H, I know he's from a previous era. But, like, we had, like, some of the more quality matches mixed in with great storytelling that kind of blended the two. So it wasn't just, like, you were only into wrestling because of the soap operas. Mm-hmm. So for me personally, I guess off of that, I'm going to go with the Rufus Aggression. And I also want to add just because that's when women were actually, like, wrestling for real, for real. Mm. at least when i was watching i mean i got a taste of yeah i feel like females were wrestling wrestling i, I, I feel like they, they actually started like wrestling wrestling like i mean because like, who did you have in, who did you really have in the attitude era that was like a female that was like actually wrestling wrestling that was that wasn't china true. or jazz or jackie like you only had like a few names to like go after right. but as a female like as like a small girl that was watching wrestling i obviously want to resonate with another woman right. and i happened to walk right in on when lita was away from the hardy she was doing her own thing trish was trying to get the hang of the ropes i had molly holly i had victoria to go off of christy hemi also came in like it was it was fun for me so Mm. i'm gonna go with that but i could be biased that's just that's just what i saw as a kid Mm. what do you think what was the what was the your favorite era of wrestling so funny thing is i'm going to have to agree with you i believe that the best era of wrestling in WWE was the ruthless aggression era. And the reason why I say the ruthless, I feel like the ruthless aggression era was better than the attitude era because the ruthless aggression era was a more polished attitude era. It was a more polished, more stacked version of the attitude era. So let's, let's, let's talk about it. Right. So in the attitude era, you had rock, you had, you know, Austin, you had Hunter, you had angle, who else did you have? You had Mick Foley for a little bit, but what was yeah. your mid card scene looking like? What was your tag team scene looking like? That's you true. had probably the New Age Outlaws as the, as like the tag team of that era. Uh, Edge and actually, I take that back. Edge and Christian Dudley Boys, um, Hardys. So yeah, you had a pretty good tag team scene around that time. But women's and mid card were kind of like the weak points of that era. But because the attitude, era, because the ruthless aggression era, um was essentially what happened when WWE bought WCW and ECW. You had the creative geniuses behind ECW and WCW booking Raw and SmackDown as separate brands. You had a stacked main event scene. You had Triple H, you had Angle, you had Rock, 
You had Undertaker. You had Austin for a little bit. You started getting an emerging Brock Lesnar, an emerging John Cena, an emerging Batista, an emerging Randy Orton. Then in the mid-card scene, you see the rise of Edge. You see Eddie Guerrero. You see Chris Benoit. You see Rhino. Um, in the Intercontinental scene, you have Randy Orton. Um, you have Rob Van Dam. You have Booker T. Um, you still have the in, – in the tag teams, you still have the Dudleys. Um at one point you had you had Edge and like a couple other you had rated RKO, DX made a return. I just feel like the ruthless aggression. And then on top of that, the And what was SmackDown rate. birthed? Uh SmackDown, the the so SmackDown came out in officially in 1999. But I feel like the SmackDown that we all know and love was really refined around 02 because of the SmackDown six, right? When Paul Heyman got creative control over SmackDown and you saw him booking Eddie Guerrero and Edge. And oh my God, and Rey Mysterio and Kurt yes. Angle. And we saw him, and, and mind you, Big Show jumped from WCW to WWE during the Attitude Era. His best run, arguably, was during the Ruthless Aggression Era when he was being utilized by Paul Heyman. So I feel like when it comes to the, the different eras in WWE, I feel like the Ruthless Aggression Era is by far the best era. Uh, because yeah. I think it was just more polished. Uh, I think that they had they had a blueprint. Like, they had a blueprint. They had a system. They figured out what worked for them. And they were able to kind of go from there and build more stars and integrate people from other products into their product and make it successful. So that's that's my thing pertaining to No, that. I agree with you, man. I shall look for that picture where they had – it's a picture that I always see on Twitter all the time. But it's a specific year in wrestling where they had a lineup of the locker room. And, like, every time I see the picture for SmackDown versus Raw, to me, it's, like, the, the greatest lineup. Like, the greatest year of having a roster ever. <laughs> from personally, for me. I'm trying to remember what it was. Like, I, you know what picture I'm talking about, right? They're sitting in the locker room. You see John Cena. And you see all the great sh- – that you just mentioned. Like, and it's put into perspective. Because of you, how deep they were, how stacked they were. Yes, yeah, like it was the most complete roster. Like you just went over how again, like tag uh, the tag teams, the mid cards, like the world heavyweights, the cruiserweights, or all that. Like it was just, and everyone felt important. Like I don't explain it. There wasn't like really much low points in the shows. Like now I could, I know when to walk away from the screen and go take a break. Right. Like you didn't do that back in the ruthless aggression. So that makes yeah, sense. now I know the audience thinks. Yeah, I wanna, I wanna know what y'all think. What was the best era in the history of WWE? Let us know in the comments below. But we're going we're gonna to move on. So, uh, speaking of, of television, speaking of, of, of record-setting eras, it seems like AEW is peaking right now. Because according to Fightful, uh, sources at Warner Brothers Discovery say that they're in a deep extension talk with All Elite Wrestling. Considering that they've just added Collision... Um, to their slate of programming, and they're already talking about an extension. Does this talk about the success of AEW, or does this talk about, or, or is this a reflection of where Warner Brothers Discovery is as a company? Well, why not both? And both could be true. Mm. Elaborate. Obviously, no. I'm, a, I, I'm not as I'm not so deep into this type of stuff. This is usually your department, but off of the way where I'm sitting and I'm looking at it on my vocabulary, I personally think that. <laughs> no, I personally think that it, it looks like Warner Bros. has a fave. They're definitely very close with AEW. Um, I don't think Tony Khan's a great businessman, but in terms of this, like he be turning it the fuck up because, like I said, like how how did we just get collision not too long ago and we're already discussing an extension? We don't know what extension means. Extension could mean like another day out the week that they're mm-hmm. planning on doing something. You know, are they going to claim a Monday, a Tuesday, a Thursday? Like, what are they doing? Right. Um, does that mean they're getting another TV show in general that's maybe not actual wrestling but something else? But for them to just be rapidly growing with such a major um, company program, yeah, I think speaks volumes about... AEW right. and how they're again always going to be major competition. Um, I think it's very good for them, very good for Warner Bro. But like I said, this is your department, <laughs> Jordan. So you can pick it up from here. Say less. Um, so here's 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 my take on this entire thing. I feel like all elite wrestling, first of all, there's a lesson in this, a life lesson. Go where you're wanted. Go where you're wanted. 
There will always be space for you in places that want you, in places that value you, in places that desire you. That's the life lesson. So that's number one. Number two, all elite wrestling has evolved from a t-shirt company into arguably the most valuable property uh, that Warner Brothers Discovery has. If you look at everything else, they ain't doing too hot. I mean, considering that the, you know, if you follow the DC franchise, the Flash flopped. Um, bad. Um, in addition to that, you know, because of what's happening with the writer strike, there isn't a lot of new content being developed. But AEW is putting on weekly television. They're putting on weekly television on multiple stations. They're drawing viewers. They have the replay value going on. And I feel like what's happening is just that it's it's a reflection of both, like you said. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I could talk about Tony Khan as a businessman because I don't know what he is as a businessman. You know what I mean? It seems that he's made some great sound decisions. If for nothing else, he partnered up with a media conglomerate that wanted him, making it a lot easier to go into talks about an extension, talks about, you know, kind of taking place and taking space on TBS and TNT. Um, and just the fact that they're already talking extensions is just an exciting thing because this means more money for the wrestlers. I expect to see when it comes to AEW a lot more live events, uh, a lot more, you know, grander television. But they're running, listen, AEW's running is getting ran a bag. And it's because Warner Brothers Discovery sees the value in it. It's so funny because, like, Coach, Jonathan Coachman, he put out a tweet. A I haven't heard ago. that name in years. What the in hell? Years, right? He put he put out a he put out a, a tweet some weeks ago um, about Saturday night television, Saturday night wrestling. Coachman, uh, AEW. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna um I'm gonna see if I can find the tweet. Um, but essentially, Why you got his theme song stuck in my head. Thanks to you. Haw hitting back breaking. <laughs> his, his, I'm not gonna lie, his song was a little AO. If he ain't do nothing, he came out with a fire ass theme song that is part Literally. of my hit li- my playlist, bro. But go ahead. <laughs> so he he essentially he put out a tweet and he was talking about um there we go. He was talking about just like the fact that Saturday night, here we go. He says, Kyle. What do I know? Been out of the business for too long. You don't know a you don't know AEW fans. You're an idiot. Just watch. Tony will show you. Let me repeat myself for those except Kyle who clearly listen. Wrestling, so right? Child to wrestling, sh- <laughs> <laughs> wrestling, sh- wrestling shoes. He he was grammatically incorrect. He said wrestling shoes do not work on Saturdays. I think he meant to say shows. Never have. Never will. Now you can, you all can try and come up with something else, but try and understand some of us who are in the business kind of know what we're talking about. All that said, I would never float about being right and an entire fi- fan base being wrong. Not my style. What I will say in response to that, I obviously Jonathan Coachman being in the WWE, having a prominent on-screen role, definitely knows a lot more about the business than us regular fans do. However... Whoever is running AEW a bag has a lot more access to data than all of us do. Only they know the impact that AEW has on the spreadsheet and on the business portfolio of Warner Brothers Discovery. And clearly, if they are, if they were given another show and they're already in deep extension talks, uh, clearly they're making an impact. So I don't know. Maybe we all just are dumb, but I think AEW is doing well. And they're in, they're going in a positive trajectory. So, you know, there's that. I just can't imagine the way Tony Khan makes his business deals like behind closed doors. Just because I imagine him so and so fidgety talking. But we got somebody else to speak for him. But you know, right? we don't we don't know what he's like. We don't know what he's like in the boardroom. I'm going to keep it at that. But I mean, listen, if he's getting all this money, he he doing something right. Right. So, <laughs> he's doing something right. But we want to know how you guys feel about about uh, AEW being in extension talks. Let us know in the comments below, but we're going to move on. So, uh, as of this past week, the WWE Performance Center turns 
10 years old. The facility that was opened by Triple H over 10 years ago has produced some of the most notable WWE superstars on screen, such as Roman Reigns, Seth Rollins, Kevin Owens, Sami Zayn, Bianca Belair, Charlotte, uh, Becky Lynch, even down to former WWE superstar who is now known as Mercedes Monet, Sasha Banks. I just want to know, what is your opinion on the impact of the WWE Performance Center? Um, well, I I love that they had a performance center just because, um, again, I'm, this is gonna be this is gonna be me sounding biased or whatnot, but um, growing up watching like the females wrestle and then hearing as an adult that they had to learn everything on the fly as they go along, while most people had to go through a wrestling school and then work their way to get there. I find it great now that it kind of gives everyone like a fair chance to be great, mm-hmm. you know, offering a performance center to make everyone feel more secure going out there. I can never imagine what the hell it's like, bro, mm-hmm. to just like for some people to be hand selected with no experience whatsoever. And then you're just kind of told to go wrestle in front of a bunch of people. I kind of love the fact that they have the performance center for that to help mold people. And it's pretty awesome, too, because like there's people who... I love watching or loved watching like Sasha Banks, for example. And to think that like she, her, her character was going to go off in a totally different direction until certain coaches that she worked with helped mold her boss character into what it is. I forgot what she had beforehand in her mind when she was choosing to like go about like her character for selection, but they're the ones that gave her the confidence to kind of go with the boss direction and kind of emulate a little bit of Snoop Dogg. And it's like this unique character that we would never have thought of before. Like, because it's kind of hard, bro. It's kind of hard to like be a wrestler when you think about it, especially in the WWE, because your goal is to choose something that's different, larger than life, and resonates with characters. And I think it's like a blessing for all the people that are in the performance center to have legends like guide them to kind of just like give them that confidence that they need for whatever idea they have or to help just like mold it into like the right direction that it should have been going in. So it's great. And I think that they should have it. I think that most promotions should, most major promotions should have a performance center for that reason. Cause I mean, it helps like who, who, who better to know. If, if I was in the, the uh, performance center, I'm definitely taking triple H's advice. I'm definitely taking like Shawn Michaels advice. Like who knows better than the, than the people who are putting asses in seats, you know what I'm saying? And putting on five-star classics. So I think it's a great thing. I hope that it continues. Um, it would make me very upset if they actually did get rid of it because, again, like we have the greatest of the greats right now for our era because of it. Um, so, yeah, that's what I think about it. What do you think about the Performance Center and its impact? Man, the Performance Center has not just elevated WWE. It saved professional wrestling. Even down to the just just the venue, right? Just the venue. It was the primary place where Raw and SmackDown was recorded during the pandemic. That alone helped sustain WWE. Having their own facility in Florida was able to keep them afloat during a time that was uh, very, very tumultuous, to say the least. Now, as it pertains Mm -hmm. to just the success of the Performance Center, I think that one of the people that we need to credit is the American dream, Dusty Rhodes. The way that he mentored uh, and, and, and looked after so many girls and guys and, and help mold them into the people that they are, you can see Dusty's fingerprints and the fingerprints of the Performance Center on pretty much every WWE superstar that ends up going up to the main roster or any any or even just ends up going elsewhere. I think the Performance Center has had a, a significant impact because, and the reason why I say that it has saved wrestling is because the, the people that have gone through there, whether they're in WWE or not, still carry the lessons that they've brought with them in that performance center elsewhere. Look at Adam Cole. Um, Even when you see Adam Cole on AEW, you can see that he carried a lot of the stuff that guys like Shawn Michaels and guys like Triple H taught him and Roderick Strong. Uh, Even guys like Jon Moxley, who is a free kind of spirited character, you can see that he took stuff from there and kind of brought it with him. And then obviously we have the guys who are the faces of, of WWE at this point in time, Roman Reigns, Seth Rollins, right? Seth Rollins was someone who was very, very big on the independent scene as Tyler Black. They He went through the Performance Center. He learned the WWE way, and he's arguably bigger than he's ever been. And Roman Reigns, we don't we don't really have to say much about Roman Reigns. Uh, the, like, 
the fact that the Performance Center has molded the next generation of wrestlers and are continuing to mold the next generation of wrestlers, um, not just the next generation of wrestlers, but even at this point, got women and, and men who are first ballot Hall of Famers at this point in their career. Roman Reigns is a first ballot Hall, Hall of Famer. So is Seth Rollins. So is John Moxley. In my opinion, so is Bray Wyatt. Charlotte, Becky, Sasha, Bailey, Bianca. They've all been through the Performance Center. Asuka, Performance Center. These people are all first ballot Hall of Famers. And we're not even talking about the girls and the guys that are coming through NXT now who have an enormous potential. So I just think that the the the, the WWE Performance Center has not just say not just elevated WWE, but it has saved professional wrestling as a whole. Because I forgot about that. The whole the, pandemic, man. Yeah. The whole pandemic thing. And and think about this. There's people who left WWE who carry that WWE polish with them. And because of that polish and because of that presentation, like they were able to succeed in other companies. You know what I'm saying? So I, I, I think that that's a very, very big, big thing. And that's just like my opinion on the impact of the WWE Performance Center. But yeah, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> did you have anything else to say, bro? No, nah, I did not. You, you kind of like stole everything else out of my brain. Yes. I you know, we do that. <laughs> but, they, but uh but yeah let us know how you guys feel about the WWE performance center turning 10 years old what are some of the things that 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 the performance center has given us as fans but we're gonna be moving on so uh aw fight forever recently was released and it has been announced that they have brought in nearly a million dollars in revenue since the release of the game so i wanted to know how did you feel about kind of like, I guess, their first week? And how do you feel about the financial impact that the game has made? Oh, yeah. Let wrestling video games be great again. Let them be fun again. Let them be popular again. Like, this makes me excited. Like, do you remember being a kid? And, I mean, I'm not sure if your mom was set up differently. But I never got games when they were first released. I had to wait till Christmas when they were on sale. <laughs> and I guess I got them for Christmas. <laughs> Because my mom was not paying that full 60. No, 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 no. But <laughs> um, I felt like WWE games kind of killed off the momentum <laughs> of how great wrestling games were and how popular they were. So to hear that, like, they made a million dollars, like, that's great. Because, again, like you said, they were just like a T-shirt company in the eyes of most people, like, three and a half years ago. Mm. And who knows? It could, like, maybe encourage other people promotions to put out different wrestling games like it's fun like wrestling games are so fun because like it just kind of lets you be able to like let loose and um i know people came in with different expectations of the game and we got so used to like the format of how wwe games over time went from being goofy and wacky to just being more close to realism mm -hmm. and i like the fact that they kind of took old properties of what video games should be like they should they really shouldn't be stressful although i told jordan i love to be stressed out during video games um but video games should be fun they should be a little goofy they should just let you just let loose and stuff like that and they just took the most simplistic properties they didn't focus on on making it as real as what we're watching and like look how much um positive attention and feedback that they're getting back and it's showing in the revenue so I think it's something that should be celebrated. It should be applauded. And and then, again, it also makes me think, huh, like, is that going to change how maybe, like, WWE is going to put out their next set of games? Mm. Are they going to try to go back to their old ways that made the game fun? Mm -hmm. And maybe, like, tone it down on trying to make everything seem realistic and just, you know... Like, for crying out loud, in AEW uh, Fight Forever, we got, like, bombs, we got skateboards, we got fire, we got all types of buffoonery, but it's, like, it's cool. It's cool. Um, so, I think it's great. I definitely still want the game whenever I choose whatever console I want. Jordan, what do you think about it? And does that motivate you to even get um, Fight Forever? I 100% want to get Fight Forever. We were Before the show even started, we were talking about I was I was considering getting a Nintendo Switch. My PS4 broke. It's a whole story. I don't want to get into it. But <laughs> what I will say is that I feel like um, AEW has done significantly well. This is just kind of like another testament to Tony Khan and the team there. Like, AEW has done significantly well. I was just kind of looking up some stats. Based on their first week sales in the UK, they were a top five seller. 
uh, and oh. they surpass titles. They surpass titles like Mario Kart, God of War, FIFA, Hogwarts not Leg- Mario. Legacy, Call of Duty, Modern Warfare 2. So, like, it, it's not, you know, a scrub of a game. It's been up there with some of the biggest titles in the UK, and that's just a, t- a testament to the quality of game. Now, do I feel like this is going to change WWE strategy? No. I feel really? like... No, I don't think so. And the reason why I say that is because I feel like this is WWE's lane. I feel like WWE tried to do an arcade game and it didn't sell that well. And they're just sticking with the realistic graphics. Are you talking about the mobile game? No, 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 no. No, no, no. There was a WWE. I forgot the name of it. It was like the it was like the one where everybody was like super big. But I forget the name of it at the time. But, I thought that was only on your phone for some reason. Nah, nah, nah. nah. It was for like PS3, PS4, I believe. But that's because yeah. that was too cartoonic. Like you had to get it like right in the middle. Like right kind of how like SmackDown, Here Comes the Pain and Shut Your Mouth was. Yeah, when you were throwing cats off the, the top of the fist. But, <laughs> but I feel like part of the reason why AEW's game is so successful is because it contrasts WWE. You know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like the diversity helps the diversity of games because I feel like it's not really an either or. It's like there's certain things about this that I like and then there's certain things about this that I like. When I want to, like, get into, like, an intense, realistic wrestling game, I can go to 2K. If I want to do something fun, arcadey, I'll do AEW. But I feel like part of the reason why uh, Fight Forever is doing so well is because it's a different game from WWE. And I feel like part of the reason why WWE 2K is going to continue to do well is because it's going to be a different game from AEW Fight Forever. I feel like the diversity and the contrast between two games is the reason why both games are popular and that people want to play both and that it's not a competition because they're two totally different games. You know what I mean? So I, 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 I'm I very, very happy that they're doing well. I really, really, really want to get a Switch or some type of gaming system so I can play. Um, but we'll see. We will definitely see, but I, I am very, very happy as far as Fight Forever and, like, just the feel of it. It just looks fun and playable. And, like, unlike Mo, I like to have fun while playing my games. <laughs> I like to leave my anxiety for things pertaining to, like, my 9-to-5 job. And But you don't other- feel, like, accomplished, bro? Like, that one level that you couldn't beat for a whole week, you finally beat it. You don't feel like you just, you're the man of the earth. <laughs> like, yes. I feel like yes. no one can talk to me differently. Yeah, I just like, be Shao also, Kahn. You know, yes, but like, no. I like peace. <laughs> All right. Part of the reason why you like that is because you consistently choose what? Chaos. And that is the reason why. <laughs> <laughs> is the reason why as an accomplishment to you. But anyway, other than that, but we want to know how you guys have have has anybody I want to know. Has anybody played the game AW Fight Forever? If so, let us know how you feel about the game in the comments. Maybe we'll both play it. We'll upload some footage of us playing the game. I don't know. We'll I'm definitely going to be his ass. Yeah, I, I, listen, I listen. I bet you are. <laughs> I play to I be stressed you. out. All right. And and listen, the last thing, listen, I'm not going to be out here profusely sweating. I will I will do a Kevin Nash. <laughs> Finger poker do me, pin me. All right. I'm not going to. I'm not no. gonna be out here. Not I, I'm not out here. Listen, I already go to the gym. I'm not trying to have a hit workout while playing a video game. Take the pen. Take the pen. I got it. I choose peace. All right. I choose peace. I choose um, conquer. I choose. Listen, that's the difference between me and you. <laughs> but yeah, let us know in the comments. We're gonna move on to the last topic of the show. So, as of this week, also. Roman Reigns has surpassed Hulk Hogan for the longest WWE championship reign in the WrestleMania era with uh, with a reign that is surpassing 1,093 days. I believe that the previous record was 1,092 days. And just to be clear, when we're talking about the WrestleMania era, we're essentially talking about the last 40, 40 years in WWE history. So Roman Reigns has had the longest WWE championship reign uh, in the past 40 years. So I want to know how you feel about that. Do you think it's too long? Do you think it's too short? Do you think it's well-deserved? Let me know. Well, first and foremost, I would like to preface this by saying, <clears throat> in the words of the great Iron Sheik, fuck the Hulk Hogan. <laughs> Rest, in peace. Rest in peace, Iron Sheik. Rest in peace. Um, I think it's completely well-deserved. Um, just because... As I said previous times, this is like the greatest like 
not only this uh, character development I've seen from WWE in quite some time, that's actually on the main roster, not from like NXT or whatnot, but like actual layers and layers and layers to a story, to all different characters, to where everyone's eating by the end of it. Like it is such a fruitful reign. His reign embodies what most championship title range should feel like. I don't feel like you should just get the belt just because you're good, but because of the power that you have and the impact you're going to have on not only the company, but the roster itself. Because, like, as we said before, whoever takes it off of Roman, um, not only is that going to be a huge notch on their belt, but it's just, like, the amount of, like, layers that goes into this belt now that you are literally carrying and all the people that you basically healed and gave a facelift to the characters behind you while you did that it's just it's immense so i think that it i know there's a lot of people that are sick and tired of the bloodline storyline but i feel like you need to see like the good that's came out of it and why they needed to like let him hold on to it for this long Cause I was a huge Roman Reign hater. It took me a long time, even when he turned heel, for me to even like come around to him. And there were times where I was like complaining and nagging, saying, "Yo, get the belt off of him! Like, you know, you're not gonna give it to Daniel. You're not gonna give it to Edge. You're not gonna give it to Seth. Like, what are we doing here?" But then, like, I sit back and I'm like, "Wow! Like, he really helped this roster. He fed this roster with this reign. Mm-hmm. Like, that has to get a round of applause." And also, like, why did we not put an end to Hulk Hogan's reign any sooner? <laughs> to be honest, I just, no, I'm just saying, like, I just feel like that's a weird thing to keep around in the background when there's been so many other greater stars since Hulk Hogan. That, like, I didn't even know of that knowledge until this came out about Roman. But I want to hear your take about the Thousand Days and why do they hold off and choose Roman? I feel like the reason why is because they were waiting for the perfect storm. I feel like it's all about timing when it comes to situations like these. I feel like if we, if we go back from the Attitude Era until now, or not from the Attitude Era, from Hulk Hogan's era until now, right? We're talking about, you know, we're talking about late 80s, so that's still Hogan. We're talking about early 90s, mid 90s. Now we're getting into Sean. We're getting into Brett. Now we're talking about Rock and then Austin. Then we're talking about Triple H. And I feel like during the 90s, it was a point in time where the title had to go back and forth to multiple people to keep the audience engaged because this was the era where wrestling was live, right? WCW Monday Nitro was live. WWE Raw went live in response to Nitro being live. So they had to continue to make everything surprising. So someone couldn't hold that belt for too long. And I feel like that principle kind of carried over into the Ruthless Aggression era and even into the PG era. Right, you wanted to keep people engaged, so nobody's reign was like super duper long. I feel like this is a big thing of timing because, like, I didn't even know that his reign was that long until it was mentioned, and that is a testament to how good the storyline is. I feel like the story should be so good that you're not even paying attention to the accolades that someone attains because you're just so invested in this. So like, I'm still trying to figure out if like Jay is going to challenge at SummerSlam. And, and then it's like, up oh, Roman just surpassed Hogan. And it's just like, wait, whoa, whoa, how, how, wait, how did that happen? It was because I was so invested in the story. Um, but I do believe that it is well-deserved because I think that it, it is literally the perfect kind of trifecta and blending of all the elements you have a guy in Roman Reigns who is easily the the biggest draw in rest, the biggest wrestler in the world based on how much he draws. He is at the top of his game. He is the best version of himself. He is the most engaging version of himself. And he is on top of WWE and he holds the belt. So you have that aspect. Then you have the aspect of the storyline. The Bloodline storyline has been a major part of WWE programming for the better part of three years. It has elevated his family. It has elevated people outside of his family. It has elevated a bunch of people on the roster. It's damn near elevated every championship because, like I said in a couple episodes before, it is the Bloodline storyline that made the tag team championships uh, 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 a main event at WrestleMania. 
which I don't think we've seen in the modern era. It is the bloodline storyline that elevated the U.S. title, that elevated the, the Universal and the WWE Championship, that elevated Money in the Bank. Because a big thing going into this Money in the Bank was who's going to win it because this person can potentially dethrone Roman. They have the case or the means to dethrone Roman. So the money in the bank value was elevated. It is elevated every championship. It is elevated every person involved. It is elevated every like it's just elevated the the whole program. The 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 the, the, the tribal court segment lasted 40 minutes. A 40 minute segment. And nobody complained about how long it was. It should tell you how how ele- how how well this storyline has elevated the entire company. Um, and I like it, it, I I think that Roman Reigns deserves to surpass Hulk Hogan. And I believe that the way that he did it um, was phenomenal because this is literally the best story in the history of WWE. There is no story that has been this good ever, ever, that has been this layered, that has remained at the top of the card, that has elevated this many people. So that's my that's my little stance on that. I just had to ask now that she listed all that. Do you think you can really can make make a valid argument right now on who's better between John Cena and Roman Reigns based off of their effect on the company and that the fact that they gave this privilege to Roman to have the title exceed um Hulk Hogan's reign versus, you know, John Cena? Given again like how just of a household name he is. I mean, he just right. came back to Money in the Bank and like the amount of cheers that was just ringing through the arena. Do you think people are going to look back and have like this argument of comparing like who Absolutely. had a better, more lasting effect on the company, John Cena or Roman Reigns? Like, can you have that even now? Absolutely. You can have that even now, because I believe I, I think it's very the, the Cena and Roman debate is like the LeBron Jordan debate. It's like there are certain things that you can. Like there's certain things that you can kind of make the argument for now because of how great it is now. Like sometimes I feel like you don't really appreciate things until they're gone. And I feel like that's going to be the case for Roman, just like it was the case for John. But I feel like what's happening now is so great that you can make the argument for it now because the, of the rarity that is attached to this storyline and the longevity that is attached to it and the, and the quality Literally every premium live event for the past year, there has been a plot twist. We cannot say that for any other storyline in WWE in the past 25 years. So I I think that you can make that argument. And I feel like that conversation of Roman and John is going to be the LeBron, Michael Jordan argument of the WWE once Roman Reigns retires. What about you? How do you feel about it? I feel like you could actually make that argument now, but I feel like the same way it didn't settle in for fans how important John Cena was to the company until he left and then he came back and he just had like this enormous pop. I don't think people are going to be able to like foresee that till he takes like you say like a year off from the company and like he comes back and we see the reaction that he gets because he really is that man and he really is like the face of the company as as we're speaking. Like, he has elevated it. He has elevated the roster. He has elevated people around him. Um, I I feel like you could make an argument for both. If you would have asked me, like, three years ago, I'm cursing you out for even trying to put Roman Reigns in the same conversation as Cena. Because I was a Cena girl growing up, bro. Like, I might even argue tooth and nail about Cena versus The Rock, okay? But with all that he's done in such a small amount of time... Yeah, that's quite the argument that you you could really put a whole case up. You really could, because right. he could he could leave right now, and that man's like his net worth, his stocks is just way the hell up here. Anyone that takes him for anything, whether it's wrestling related or movie related or whatever the hell related, like they found a gold mine in Roman for what he did, and the right. high note he'd be walking off on. But I want to ask the audience this. Do you think you could build a case for John Cena versus Roman in terms of their legacy in this company? I think. Um, personally, I feel like as of right now, I think it's equal almost. 
I feel like Whoa. I think they're I think they're on the same level. And that sucks because I'm a Cena fan. But I feel like the one thing John Cena has done it all, right? The one thing that has kind of eluded John his entire career is his ability to put others over. But Roman has done that and has still looked dominant and has still... I don't remember any storyline that, that John Cena was in that is as good as the Bloodline storyline. I don't remember any... Because John was never really in a faction. Like, John he was, was always never, on... Very true. But at the same time, I feel like he... I feel like... Ugh, John was never in a faction. But I still feel like he could have participated in a story that was more engaging. And there were opportunities for factions with John. But that's a different story for a different day. But I feel like Roman and John are kind of equal. I feel like they're, you know, different animal, different animal, same beast type of situation. I just feel like it's it's one of those like John Cena as an individual talent is capable of things that Roman may have not done. But at the same time, Roman has done things that John Cena didn't do during his career. Where, so, I thought they need to run it back. They need to run back John Cena versus Roman. They should like had never had Austin Theory versus Cena, and you could give it some time and mm-hmm. give them the match. And I feel like that would be the next Cena versus The Rock. It'd be that level of hype. You so you're saying that Cena versus Roman is the next Rock versus Cena? Yeah, considering where they stand in the company. Ooh, that's a good. That's a good little hot take. Someone, someone's going to probably eat my ass up for that, but I'm standing on it firm, 10 toes down. 10 toes down. <laughs> We're gonna, I'm, I'm actually going to put that question out there. Do you feel like Roman Reigns versus John Cena in 2023 will be the next John Cena versus The Rock? Let us know in the comments. But that concludes today's show. Thank you guys so much for, for kicking it with us listening to us once again obviously we'll be back next week and we'll see you guys there